Every week we do a Q&A with interesting and accomplished members of the adaptive community to find how they persevered, how they innovated, how they built communities, and how they found solutions. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast. All right, welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast. I'm with Raymond Martin today, or we can call you Ray, I assume, right? Yes, you can. Go by Ray. We'll actually, we'll, in a lot of ways, we are going to call you the man. You've been the man in in the T52 class for a long period of time. This will be third games, seven medals, six gold, one silver, and you were heading to Tokyo. What? I mean, this is like, this is soon, right? It's getting right around the corner, a couple of weeks. Yes, uh, it's two weeks from Friday. So yeah, just over two weeks until we're heading up to Tokyo, going for my third games. Well, welcome to the podcast. Really appreciate it. Glad to see you're wearing the USA. Is it different for you now coming into a third games? And and we'll talk about like sort of lifestyle stuff as well, where you've had you've had some changes too. Yes, it's certainly different uh, coming around to the third games. Um, from the first games and even from the second games, I think... Um, you gain a little bit more experience every time and how your uh, your perspective on it changes, I think a little bit um, as you go on through your career. So um, definitely a different experience, but I'm excited and nervous all at the same time. Excited and nervous, but then you have a pre-race ritual, right? Uh, that is the, the, when you get nervous, is this right? Did I read it correctly? Where did you read this? Where did you I must read have this? Really this done is your good. research. <laughs> this is funny. Okay, so, uh, so, 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 where did I read it? This is the this is the question. I'm not exactly sure where I read it, but I think that that you were uh, that you were trying to uh, that you were trying to trying to minimize sort of minimize yourself in in terms of like your importance or whatever, and be able to to go and compete. I, yes. Okay. Yeah, I understand. I thought it was like a bunch of actions, and I was like, "When did I say this?" Uh, anyway, yeah. What did so I say? <laughs> that's definitely how I approached the, especially very high-profile event like the Paralympic Games. I really try to remove myself from the moment up until the gun goes off. So when you when you're at the games, you have a call time of maybe forty-five minutes or so, and that's a lot of time. Where, that's a uh, substantial amount of time where you can kind of psych yourself out even if you're kind of okay you feel okay and warm up and stuff when you're sitting in that call tent for that long you're sitting still you're forced to sit next to your competitors for that long you can really get in your own head so I really try to make an intentional effort to sort of remove myself from uh, that moment and usually it helps Usually it helps. And it's funny, people don't understand. I mean, we see a little bit of this on television, like watching the Olympics and you see people kind of in the indoor underneath the stadium kind of kind of track going back and forth. And you you get a chance to do that. But you also you can be stuck in that call room. And I remember my first big games were were the world championships in Berlin in 94. And it felt and this was we were like underneath the stadium it felt like we were in like a basement kind of thing and and you're in the dark and it's cold and you know your legs start start uh, start spasming because you've been sitting in your chair for so long you get your muscles get cold and then you pop out and it's sunny and it's warm and it's like okay ready go ahead and race and that it, it's a really hard situation isn't it especially for a big event because it's different than what you experience in your regular races. Yes, that is completely true. When you're doing uh, smaller events, I would say, but still like international events, you have a call time, but usually it's about 15 minutes, 20 minutes at the most. And that goes by fairly quickly. So you come off the warm up track and you're still pretty warm by the time the race starts. But there's a lot of logistical things that need to go on at the game. So that means a very long call time. And it's certainly, uh, a lot of things can go wrong in that time. You can have flat tires. You can, like you said, start um, spasming because of the weather. I remember London in 2012. It was the summer, but it was not warm in London. I was wearing a lot of suits the entire time, uh, especially 
in the night sessions, it got quite cold. So um, definitely a lot can go wrong um, in things like the call time, but you don't see that uh, on TV, right? You just see that you're getting ready, but you don't really see how much downtime there actually is leading up to your event. And how much you have to bring to your event to be able to perform at quote unquote normal levels. I want to get back to, I want, I want to get to at some point the competition, but, but can we take a little bit of a step back first? I read that you got into your first racing chair when you were five years old. Is this right? Yes. yes five years I old, did this tiny little racing point. chair. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that was 27 now. Yeah, that was 22 years ago. So I've been in a race chair for a very long time. And it sounds like it was, it was, love at first sight kind of thing is that is that the way it worked for you yeah it really was I was uh kind of picked out in gym class by the um coach for the team at the time and I loved it I really did I liked the social aspect of it I was able to socialize with others and I really liked the the movement I really liked going fast and I picked up a lot of sports, like in high school and stuff. I've tried a bunch of different sports, but uh, racing has really been the one that stuck with me, and I'm still doing it today. So, yeah, exactly. Which 22 years is is a long time, but then, yeah, you know, we can definitely look at some wheelchair racers who've been doing it. I mean, I think of like a Heinz Fry or somebody like that who might who's probably been doing it for like 40 something years or something like maybe even more. Who knows? Right. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he's been doing it professionally for that long. I mean, I, I was doing it maybe once a week, right, when I was a kid, but he's been doing it professionally for that long. That's so impressive. It's mind-boggling. I mean, there certainly are some heroes within our sport that you look at and think, wow, that is, that is, that is a competitor, that is a peer, and that's a hero all at the same time, which is just right. absolutely amazing. Now, you're in the T-52 class. So what is the T-52 class and how do you qualify for that T-52 class? Yeah, so in wheelchair racing, there's four uh, classifications. There's 51 all the way up to 54. Um, the 53s and the 54s are traditionally paraplegic, so they're affected um, just from the lower limbs um, and down. And the 51s and the 52s, they are affected in all four limbs. Um, so the 51s, um, have their triceps uh, typically affected. They have like autonomic um, dysregulation where they have trouble like blood pressure, temperature, and all these things. Um, the 52 class is a little bit of a, I would say a misfit class where um, you certainly need to be affected in four limbs to, to qualify for the 52 class, but it's really kind of changed and evolved over the last 10 or 20 years. Um, so. I have a disability called Freeman's Sheldon syndrome. And what that does is hooks all of my joints and uh, limits my passive range of motion. And I am severely affected in my um, hands and wrists. As you can see, like this is as far as they open. And like the movement is minimal passive range of motion. So um, that's how I fit in that class. But you certainly you see um, more traditional quadriplegics that do have triceps and, and they also have things like autonomic um, dysregulation. And then um, there's a guy in our class, he's been in it for quite a long time. He has polio, as I understand it. Um, another one I think has um, maybe transverse myelitis. So it's really a mixed bag um, of competitors. So it makes it really interesting. Which is, which is a challenge, right? To have this sort of mixed bag. It's, I mean, sports never, never fair, right? I mean, like, no matter who you are, it's like, oh, you're short, you're tall, you know, you're, you're five, two, you're not going to play in the NBA, uh, you know, as much as you might want to, and as hard as you might work, most likely, you're not going to make it. But in, in adaptive sport, it gets to be that much more challenging as well, trying to, trying to level the playing field and have people of like ability or like potential ability in the same class so that it is, so that it is equal, you know, hopefully a level, a level playing field. Is yours progressive because it's, it's a, 
you know, contractures, uh, joint issues? Is it progressive? And does sport actually help or not? Yeah, so it's not progressive. Um, it's relatively stable. Um, things like sport and um, physical therapy and stuff do um, sort of temper um, symptoms, help with range of motion, but um, it's certainly if I was completely sedentary, it's not like I would become stone, right? Like there's a limit to how much it would progress. So it's relatively stable, I would say, in that point, in that aspect. It's relatively stable. And, and, and does the sport part of it, does it help? I mean, just continually using your, using your muscles and going through that range of motion to keep it from getting? Yeah, yeah. So uh, this sport, I can certainly tell I'm, when I do things like um, AB duct my arms, um, I'm pretty um, limited. I would say I can't really go up to, to straight, but I can pretty much extend my arm way back. And I think that's a result of like the pushing mechanics of the sport and something that I've been dealing for so long. So I think sports certainly helps with um, some range of motion. Helps with some range of motion. So, so, so when you were a kid, you started getting into this because it's it's one of those moving is is relatively it can, can be relatively hard, right? I mean, you're getting around in a wheelchair, and suddenly then you get into a racing wheelchair and see what it sounds like a bit of freedom in this racing wheelchair. How did that start? I mean, when you're five years old, I'm assuming you were not sort of doing double sessions and, you know, training six days a week. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I was picked picked up by the uh, coach and I believe it was because I was so active in gym class. So the team was kind of integrated into a school for children with disabilities. So the coach was also the gym instructor and she noticed that I was pretty active. So I think that's why she approached me. And I think for similar reasons, that's why I loved um, picking up sport. And how did it work? How did it progress? Is this like, okay, I'm gonna go do a 5K. This is the Thanksgiving 5K or whatever it is. Is that is that when you started or did you start on the track or? Yeah, so I started on the track. Um, I believe my first event was the 60 meters, which is not in the events at the Paralympic Games, but it is still held, I think, at the junior level. So um, I did do the shorter stuff. I did 60 meters. I believe I did up to, I want to say a 200 meter, but I'm not sure. Um, and as I got older and I got bigger and stronger, I was able to do more and more events. It started to, I would say, get pretty serious when I was in high school. I made my first um, international team for junior world championships. And I believe I was 16 at the time. And I once I made that team, I knew that I think I could hack it. And I think this is something I really want to pursue. And this was in 2010. So this was two years before London 2012. So when I kind of made that decision, I sat down with my coach at the time, Jimmy Cuevas and said, listen, I want to go to London. How can we get there? So we formed a training program, started doing things like two days, two sessions a day, and um, made, the, made my first team at 18. Now, but there, there was also, it sounded like there was a bit of impetus at one of the events from, from a swimmer. Is this... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow, you really Is this do. Is story true? Well. <laughs> yes, you do your research really well. So... <laughs> At that event, actually, at the Junior World Championships, there was a swimmer who will remain nameless, um, but apparently they were, he, he or she was um, quite destined, I heard, to make the Paralympic team. And uh, they made kind of an, a comment, not to me, to one of my friends, about um, how they didn't think that I would make it, how they didn't think um, I would ever really get to that level. And um, that really kind of set, set things in motion. So um, I guess I did fib a little bit on, on what set things in motion. That was really the, I would say, um, singular event that 
that set things in motion. Um, I got a little bit of, I would say, um, sweet revenge because I made London 2012 and I'm pretty sure this person didn't make the team, um, didn't end up making the team. So <laughs> that's a little bit of redemption there. Does this person know that you know that he or she said this and, and that it really was the, the impetus to this amazing career? I don't think they do because I've been asked this a few times, not a lot, I've been asked a few times. I don't ever remember saying it was a swimmer. Now, it was a swimmer. I'm not saying that someone's built a beat. I'm just saying that has been kind of kept well under wraps. I'm, I'm pretty sure this person doesn't know. But this was, this was the impetus and this was the thing that got you going because you also, you had, you had a nemesis in junior track as well, right? Where you couldn't quite break through one of your who, who, guy who became a really good friend as well yes right? yes yes his name is sean burns he no longer races he was um actually kind of fit into that misfit classification um story i was telling you earlier um he kind of bounced between the 52 and 53 class um, throughout his career and for most of juniors he was 52 and he was better than me in every <laughs> at every race and every year and uh, we were kind of thrown together um, to room together at that Junior World Championships. And that idea was um, thanks to my coach, Jimmy Cuevas. So I did not appreciate it at the time, but I do now because we still are really good friends. And um, that event was really what started it. So this was like this crucible event for you, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know. It really was now that I think about it, because I met another really good friend that you actually had on the show, Chelsea McClammer. Mm -hmm. I met her for the first time at that event. So, um, yeah, I guess now that you said it, it was really a big event in my life. So you decided, so this is, so you said you were, you were 18 when you went to London? Yes, I was 18 years old in London. And so you were 16, really. So, so when you're 15, I or no, 17 in when you went to the junior worlds event that was, junior worlds, that was 16 right? it was 16. 2010 was junior worlds. 2010 okay perfect and so then so then how did it happen you were still in new jersey jersey city new jersey right jersey city yep that's right <laughs> and so how did how did that training happen were you training with your coach like on a daily basis or was he giving you workouts or or how did that work yeah so when I stepped up my training from, I think before that, it was about two times a week, maybe at the most. And then once we really got serious, it was at least five times, five sessions a week. Um, he had a full-time job. He, I believe he just recently stepped down from volunteering for that team, but he, he had a full-time job and he wasn't able to dedicate, you know, every single morning, every afternoon, right, to, to training. So he would have to send me workouts um, and I was able to do uh, most of those um, on my own, either on the track, on the roller, and then I would be able to touch base with him in person those same two times a week. Wow. And so so you went from, you know, kind of your first international event in 2010, and then then you went to, to a senior national, a uh, senior international event in 2011, right? Yes, that's right. You do really... <laughs> really well research. I'm I'm a big fan of the, of your your work as a, as a journalist, and I'm impressed. Uh, you you you're continuing to impress me. Oh, yes, well, my you. my first my first adult event um, elite event was in 2011. It was the Para Pan American Games in Guadalajara, and it was really kind of that one year period between that Junior Worlds and Para Pan American Games where my performance really shot up. Um, and that, I think that was um, partially due to the training and also um, a change in um, chair positioning, biomechanics I was able to produce way more force um, just by a slight change. So that was my first um, senior event when I was 17, yep. And so with the seating position, what did you do differently? Because you sit, I mean, you've got a, you've got a narrow chair you sit relatively high in your chair. I mean, torso 
more upright than a lot of a lot of other athletes. Where were you before, and and is this is that what you ended up getting to? Was was this kind of position that you're in now? Yes, yeah. So it was it was really kind of amazing. So I'll start with where I was before. So um, I'm not sure how familiar your audience is with um, seating position, but generally what you want to be is as flat as possible um, while still being being able to produce um, a large amount of force. So if you have um, great trunk muscles, you're able to sit super flat, like almost parallel with the ground. With um, your back flat, right. Right, with your back flat, right. So to do that, what you're doing is bringing your chest to your knees, right? To get super flat. So you have your, your legs going forward and then here's like your body and then that just comes flat. Well, for me, my hips are just perpetually dislocated. Um, and it was, it's a part of my disability. They've tried to fix it and just re-dislocate. So I'm not actually able to bring my chest to my knees. Does that uh, hurt? I mean, that sounds painful <laughs> when you're talking about your, your hips being dislocated. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is. It's something you get used to, and it's just certain movements are definitely more challenging um, than others, um, just like this sort of like hip extension. So, you know, um, if, instead of bringing your chest, my chest to my knees, I'm able to bend about this far and that's it. I'm pretty much like 80 degrees maybe, right? I'm, I'm sitting straight up. So um, as a result, it made sitting in a racing chair in an efficient seat position very challenging. So if I'm not able to, to bend like this flat, I was stuck like this. I was almost like straight up. So we got me as low as I could possibly go um, for the junior worlds and that essentially consisted of me having my legs like straddle the mainframe of a race chair and um it was super uncomfortable because my legs were <laughs> like squeezing the mainframe of a race chair right and that's you're trying to go like fast yeah and, and you're trying to go fast that's it really was not comfortable um and what me and my coach decided was we got to get in a better racing position. So what we ended up having to do was instead of having that single main tube on the race chair, we actually had um, a company cut it out, um, Eagle Sports Chairs. We had them cut it out. That way they're able to put the knee tray that's normally above the mainframe. We put the knee tray below the mainframe. In that sense, it draws my whole body down and I'm able to get in a really um, much better racing position. And, and, and do you wear, do you have a strap for your, for your chest? Is it a strap or is it a bar that you actually have there? Yeah. So um, since I'm kind of teetering um, just on my knees, I have very low pressure on um, my butt in my race chair. I have a strap that goes on. It's essentially like a seatbelt. It, it swings just like a seatbelt. Um, and then I have a chest plate that goes across my mainframe. So that way um, there's something that kind of, simulates having your knees come to your chest like like i'm able to stop my body when when i come down on the stroke and that's able to um, effectively transfer some force back down to the rings instead of just kind of floating there um, and losing some of that without putting the pressure on your on your hips and your knees and and your legs so so yeah. you're able to go back and forth your upper body is able to go back and forth and and, and that was that was where you found the power. That's where you found the speed. You found that sweet spot in a lot of yeah. ways on the ring. Right. Yeah. And that's really, I would say that contributed a lot to it is there's just something about it where you're, like you said, you're able to find a speed that you just weren't able to find before. Um, and I was really fortunate that I was able to find that on the first try. Um, I know a lot of people have trouble finding that right chair position. Maybe they still haven't found it and they've gone through maybe three or five chairs. Um, just kind of went on a whim. And I mean, Barry from Eagle Sports Chairs, he had never done a chair like that before. He just kind of mocked something up. And um, that black chair that I had in London 2012 was kind of the, the prototype, I would say, <laughs> of my um, style of racing chair. 
which is great. And you mentioned Barry Ewing, who who just is who just is a genius in a lot of ways with with a chair. I mean, does does so many amazing things and has had such a great connection to the community and has has helped so many people move so far forward. And yeah, just a great guy too. So you blew up though in London. I mean, you went from kind of like getting on the junior world team to Parapan, which was really a big transition. It sounded like for you where you thought, okay, I really can be somebody a necessary step, but then did you expect to do, what did you, what did you win in London? So in London 2012, I entered in the 100, 200, 400 and 800 meter events. Um, and I won gold in all four events. Um, and it was, I would say a lot for an 18 year old to kind of, I would say absorb. Did you, did you expect that when you were going in? Uh, I really didn't expect to perform that well. Um, I knew that I was able to compete um, with, with some of the best of them. But going into the London Games, I had um, a couple of, um, I don't want to call them rivals. I feel like that's a very like hot word to say in journalism. But like, you know, really, it's just guys that you're really um, good competitors with and on the field it's competitive but you can talk just fine you guys are friends off the field i had a couple of good um i would say rivalries um going on in the different events um in the 100 meter it was with paul nitz mm -hmm. paul nitz um was sort of the um long-standing um one to watch in the 100 meter and the t52 um I don't know his exact stats, but he won several gold medals at the Paralympic Games um, leading up to London 2012. And an American um, athlete as well, who started super well. I mean, Paul's Paul's greatest attribute was his start. He was great off the line. Yeah, he was like a bullet. He was like a bullet out of a gun, really. I mean, that was amazing. And um, that was actually my downfall, right? And still is trying to get off the line uh, with the best of them really not my strong suit. So going up against someone with a start as good as Paul Nitz um, certainly made the 100 meter, I would say my event in London that I knew I would do the poorest in, or I thought I would do the poorest in. And since he was also um, an American, I was able to compete with him a lot leading up into London 2012. You kind of step up your competing um, during the years of it, during a games year. And I competed against him, I want to say maybe five or six times um, just in 2012, right before the games. And he smoked me every time, uh, all five times. Um, there was a single exception to this. I like to tell him the story. Um, I don't get to tell, tell very often because it's been so long now, but at the 2012 trials in Indianapolis, um, I actually was able to beat Paul Nitz in 100 meter. And I was ecstatic. And I don't know what happened, I don't know what I pulled together, but I was able to beat him. It wasn't by a lot, but I beat him. Then I can't, well, you know, you finish your race and, and you uh, go back to your chair and all that stuff. And someone came up to me, official, and they said that the timer didn't work. So we had to rerun the 100 meter at trials in 2012. Oh, no. And it was either trials. It was in Indianapolis. It could have been trials with Pascal, but it was an event. And it was kind of my, it, it got me excited, right? I, I was kind of nervous about the 100 meter. And I was able to pull it off once. And then the clock didn't work. And so we reran the race. Of course, he smoked me again. And that really kind of just took me. That was like a roller coaster of emotions that day, right? So um anyway but it had to be in your mind that you yes. could do it right because you'd done it once even though the clock wasn't there to document yeah yeah so i didn't know if it was a fluke or, or what happened but it it was a very small piece of the back of my mind going into london that it's possible it's unlikely but it's possible so and did you think about i mean you have your sort of your, your peacefulness when you get to the start in a big event, you know, when, when all the nerves are going, did you think, okay, well, I have to be peaceful because I have to have a great start 
in order to, and you probably couldn't really even think about having a great start because then that might preclude you from having a great start. Yeah, you're, you're dead on with this one. So my whole sort of ritual of needing to calm myself and remove myself was actually born in this sort of um, history of my 100 meter, um, especially in 2012. Um, in the 100 meter, you start on the same line. And like you said earlier, Paul Nitz, fantastic starter. So when you start the 100 meter on the same start line, and you just see how much ground he can put on you in five seconds, it really throws you for, for a loop, right? And um, I think that's what plagued me for most of 2012. So um, I ended up um, winning in London. So it wasn't a um, physique thing. It's not that I wasn't um, capable of doing it. It's, it was this um, mindset of seeing how much ground you can put on me so quickly. Like there's no way I can make up this ground in a hundred meters, right? So that's where that um, sort of ritual came about. And it was, um, it was with Paul Nitz that um, kind of started <laughs> prompted off. it. Yeah. Did you have to effectively just kind of like ignore him as well? I mean, like you knew he was going to go fast, but you couldn't even really like pay attention to him because it would affect your race. Yes, uh, that's exactly right. So uh, two things, I, I changed two things in the 100 meter at the 2012 games. So I could be misremembering at this point because it's almost 10 years, but I believe I was in one prelim and he was in another. So I wasn't racing him in the prelim. In the prelim, I was able to break the Paralympic record. And the reason, one reason is because he wasn't in that race. And the second reason was because I went about this whole um, relaxed uh, mindset about it that like, you know, it's a hundred meter. I know it's not my best event. I'm just going to go out to my first race at the Paralympic Games. I'm just going to go out and enjoy it. And I think that the combination of those two things led to that Paralympic record um, in London. For the final, I had to race with Paul Nitz um, next to me, as you can imagine. And you're only 18. I'm only 18. Yeah. So, um, I believe that you were commenting that race actually. And okay. it was either you or, or your your um coworker, but you mentioned how um I had Paul Nitz next to me, who I don't want to call him out for his age, but he was in his 40s. And I had, I believe, uh Tomoya Ito from Japan on my other side. Tomoya was, I think, 48 at the time. And there was also Salvador Hernandez. I'm dropping a lot of names, I know, but like these guys have been in the sport for a very long time. So, and then you had me, who was 18. <laughs> the youngster, yeah. Youngster, yep. So I, I had these guys next to me and I did something that I, I'm gonna tell you something I've never told anybody. So Paul Nitz, I believe was on my right side and I was starting to get like kind of nervous, right? Like he was next to me. I was like, okay, this is it, this is the final. What I did was I shut my right eye <laughs> for the 100 meter. <laughs> for the whole thing? For the whole thing. I did not see him because I didn't want to see him. So I shut my right eye. I was not able to see where he was. That way, it wouldn't, like, it doesn't matter, right? I can't see him, so I can't psych myself out. And I know that they still have the events um, on YouTube or something. Um, and I wonder if you're able to see that when my right eye is closed in that year. Oh, that's interesting. I'll have to go mm -hmm. back and see if I can find it. That is an amazing story that you just, yep. you shut your right eye. And we, I mean, that affects your depth perception. It affects a variety of different things. You know, like, can you still, you, obviously you still stayed in your lane. Right. Yeah. And I knew it may not have been shut for the whole race, but I knew that by at least the first 50 meters. And, and I think that's where they put the parent club on the track. I knew that I needed to like, be completely out of like I cannot see opponents for the first 15 minutes of this race. I'm able to generate the speed to pass him at some point, but it's usually not in 100 meters if I psych myself out. So what I said was, all right, 50 meters, I'm just going to close my right eye, just go for it. Wow, that is that is so. I have never heard a story like that. Yeah, I am shocked that it worked, but it worked. 
That is awesome. Uh, that is super, super cool. Uh, so it, it's interesting because you have had, I mean, this is, you're talking about strategies, right? Because the thing is, like in, in London, you went and you won, you won all four races. Does that hundred still stand out as, I mean, it sounds like, it, it sounds like such a threshold kind of race. I mean, it's your first gold. It's your first event, but it also, you had to do a lot in order to be able to perform at that level. And I don't know. So what was it like afterwards? What was the confidence like? Yes, uh, you're totally right. The 100 meter really did, I think, set the tone for the rest of my games because, and I was really fortunate that it was the first event because I think if it was in any other order, I don't think I would have come out with four golds. Frankly, I, I don't think I was, I would be able to because let's say that I won a gold in the 200 meters ahead of time. Um, I still had this 100 meter like lagging over my head, right? I wasn't, I didn't know how I'd do. Whereas like get the hard one out of the way at my first games, I think was really fortunate because I want to say the next event was the 400 meter. And um, that's where my other <laughs> supposed rival um, I had to face. And um, that was unique too, because um, I was not able to compete with Tomei Ito until the London Paralympic Games. Now, he was another person who was very long-standing, very successful. Um, his Beijing games were um, outstanding, um, but I wasn't able to race with him until the London Games. So the, I had the 100 meter, I won it, and it sent me in a good mood. But then the 400 meter came and it was a different race. It was just a different person that um, I had to kind of keep my eye on, so to speak. And we're not I, on. We're not on, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I, I believe that I was on the outside too. London did that a strange thing where the top seed would start in seven instead of the normal four or five. I don't know why, but I was out in seven. He had my inside. And again, I, I'm pretty sure he commented about this, but like it's it's hard not uh, doing a 400 meter on the outside. You you have no idea what's going on in the race. You have no idea where people are. You don't know if someone's coming up on you. You don't know if you are like blowing everybody else out of the water. You're just blind and you just have to go. So that was another hard part uh, of the 400 meter. But I would say that the performance, yeah, and the, and the 100 really kind of um, set me up for success, I would say, as best as, as possible. Um, I know that me and Ido had very close times leading into the London 2012 games. And um, even in the prelim, I believe we were only off by half second. So um, having that kind of confidence that came from the 100 meter, I think translated really well into the 400 meter. Um, after that, there was the 800. And similarly, Ido was another um, great performer at the 800. And this one was also different because then you add in this layer of um, drafting, right? And the 800 meter, you're able to cut in. So um, that's just a different aspect that wasn't, uh, I had never raced with him in a drafting event before. So that added another layer to it. And then I closed the game then with the 200 meter. And I will say in London 2012, the 200 meter is the one that I was confident that I would do well in. Um, I believe I had the world record at the time. And kind of going off the 100 meters starting on the same line the 200 meter you don't start on the same line right so for some reason just having that stagger I was able to get in my own head and come out of that turn strong and then um, finish the 200 meter really strong so I think the order of events in London really kind of set the tone for my career that is amazing yeah I mean it's just interesting how that how that all built on itself and how you had this this you know, introduction to the world in, in the hundred meters and then, and then continued to build on it. You've had some interesting tactics in some of the longer races where in, in Rio, in what was it, was it, in, it was in the 1500, I believe, and possibly in the 800 as well, but in the world championships as well, where you, where you went way off the front 
at the beginning. And I think this was against Edo where you went way off the front and then, and then he caught up and actually in, in Rio, he caught up and, and passed you and you were able to get in the draft and then, and then go past them again. It's, it's an interesting tactic. How did you, how did you come up with the tactic? Is it, is it something that you're going to continue to employ not to give all your secrets away? Right. Yeah. Get, get rid of the secrets leading up to Tokyo. Yeah. Uh, no. So um, I believe either retired in 2012, but um, Sato is kind of work. Um, he came on to the scene oh, right. after London. <laughs> and yes. So he was another interesting character. So we have very different strengths. Um, me and Sato, I can get going pretty quickly, um, but relative to Sato, he has a better um, max speed than me. So he takes a little bit longer to get to a higher max speed and I can get to my lower max speed faster. So you kind of have like um, opposite um, strengths. So the, the going out, <laughs> going out hard uh, tactic, actually I came up with um, Adam Bleakney, my coach. He, we kind of devised that that might be best just knowing that he takes a while to get going so the idea was go out really hard and then peel it back because then you force him to kind of come up as hard as he can and then by the time he's able to come up as hard as you know, um by the time he's able to come up and catch me he has been going as hard as he can for quite a while maybe 400 500 meters and then at that point i've been taking it a little bit easy for maybe two or three hundred meters right so by the time he hits, um, he comes up and catches me. That's when you strike again, right? Like he just catches up. Then I'm a little bit rested. I can hit, hit it hard again. So that's kind of where that started. Um, it works for, it works in, um, I believe that was Doha um, at the World Championships. Um, 15, all right. Yep, in the 15. And well, 2015 um, as well, right? In 2015, yep, yep. Um, in 2015, I believe Stephen Turgeon was in that race, and um, that was really close. I was uh, trying to help um, get to get have two Americans on the medal stand. Uh, just and using it was that close. Tactic, it, right? it was almost did it. It looked it yeah. looked really good for a while. Yeah, it was it was close, but uh, that's just how it happens. Um, and in Rio, I was gonna do the same tactic. And um, it was really interesting because I think his um, sort of um, his newness to sport, his, his um, use to the sport kind of showed in Rio. And um, that was because I went out hard as expected and I was waiting for him to come up and I thought he would come up and like sit behind me, right? He had just sprinted for five or 600 meters. You kind of expect someone to like take a break, right? Oh, I'm in, I can like take it easy. Uh, he didn't, he just kept going. So he had just sprinted for 600 meters and decided to keep going. And I was like, uh, all right, I'm just gonna jump in then. And I did, so I jumped in with him. And I think he blew himself up because I was able to come past him in the last 200 meters in Rio. So that was really, that wasn't the plan. Um, the plan was just as before, it just kind of unraveled, but it worked in my favor. It's because it's an interesting plan. I mean, you do, you accelerate so well. And we've seen, you know, you, you train with, with Tatiana too, who does, some who has you employed some similar tactics right where she accelerates so well just that great hand speed and and can create that gap and and can create that that sense of confusion that mm -hmm. sense of worry i mean it's the for the competitor behind it's easy to think well i've just lost the race like this is it i've completely lost touch it's over and then i can see where sato approaching you thought okay well where ray just died this is it. Like he, he burned himself out. He's done. I'm going past him. And at the same time, then you think, well, this is perfect for me. Yeah. If you can go past me. I'll jump in behind you, get a free ride to the end and then, and then go past you at the end. So 
I would imagine he now, I'm, I'm assuming that you're going to see him in Tokyo. Yes, um, I think if everything goes as planned, yeah, we're gonna meet again in Tokyo. And he's pushing a really strong 1500. So I think the plan is gonna have to change a little bit. I haven't really talked to Adam yet about it, but I don't think I'm um, as trained as I was back then to try and, and employ such tactics. So um, one, because I think he can uh, counter it now, but two, also, I don't think I could even do it now. Do you expect that like the 1500 and the 800 will effectively be like a match race? where it'll be the two of you, or do you expect that there will be some other people who are kind of mixing the pack up as well? Yeah, so I feel like the 1500, there's gonna be a pack. I don't know that everyone will be able to be in the lead pack. And I don't even think, I'll, I'm not sure I'll be able to push. I think he ran like a 325 or something this year. I don't think I can even come close to that. So I think if what, what Sato normally does nowadays is he just goes, he doesn't stop, he just goes. And I think he's a lot better trained now to do such um, a tactic. And I think that um, I, I don't know that the entire field can, can kind of match that realistically, right? Um, but at the same time, I'm including myself in, in that statement. So I think that there's gonna be a pack. I don't know that it'll be for, for, for gold medal, but there's certainly um, several contenders um, for uh, the rest of the medals. Well, you, you mentioned Adam Blakeney, who is, who is your coach at the University of Illinois. So you went to London, and then after London, that's when you went to the University of Illinois, I assume. Yes, that's, uh, I actually missed my first two weeks of undergrad because I was in London. So I wasn't able to go to quad day or, you know, orientation or any of those fun things because I was in London. But doing that, it's one of the University of Illinois oftentimes is like the third best nation in, in the Paralympics, right? In, in terms of track and field, in terms of medal count you had a chance to, to run with some really good athletes and some athletes who aren't necessarily in your class as well. Yes, and I think that really benefited my career uh, while I was at the University of Illinois. You have such a large number of athletes who are really competitive. And I think no matter where along you are in terms of your performance, there's usually some people within range. And when you have that um, sort of target to hit all the time, I think that pushes you to be even better and better. So even though for the first um, five or six years I was at the University of Illinois, I was the only quad, I was able to push with um, people like Chelsea McClammer, Amanda McGray, um, who are always in the lead women, and they push faster than me, and I get beat every day, right? But I was able to kind of push myself to try and stay with them once and maybe stay with them for two, two uh, reps, right? So um, having that environment, um, I think was absolutely essential to my career's performance. You list Amanda McGrory as, as your hero. Why is she your hero? I do, uh, she's great. Um, I hope she watches this at some point, but... Um, she has really been, um, I would say, a mentor for me um, ever since I was 19. She kind of, she picked me up is what she calls it. Um, and I was just able to learn a lot, um, not only about racing, but also just kind of about life. She really helped me out um, as I was getting older and transitioning and um, transitioning to my career too. So um, I think she, she, she kind of started out as this like more mentor person, but then we grew to really become like equals and uh, really good friends um, as I got older. So that's why she's my hero. Which is awesome. And, and Amanda, obviously great choice of hero there, that's for sure. And an amazing competitor and great person. But that, that being on the track with Amanda, with Chelsea McClammer, with getting stretched by, by some of the best women in the world. I mean, certainly in Rio watching Chelsea and Amanda and Tatiana 
go one, two, three in the 1500 and the 5,000 was, I mean, it's still each time I mention it, I like, I get chills just thinking about it, but these were the people that you were training with. So now when you're looking at Sato in, in Tokyo, and one of the funny things about this is that you're going to Tokyo and your biggest competitor is Japanese. There won't be people in the stands, so you won't be overwhelmed by that. But do you think that one, having had that experience at the University of Illinois, and two, that you accelerate well, does this give you a chance to potentially get in with Sato? Yes. So I, I think you're right. I think that having that training environment um, with the elite women and um, also having this kind of strength of mind, being able to accelerate very quickly, um, I think it does give me some, some uh, tricks in my bag, I would say. So even though I might not be as um, well conditioned as before, I think I might be able to pull um, a couple of a couple of things out of nowhere. So I think it's going to be a really uh, good event. Um, I think I think it is interesting that he sort of gets the home field advantage. Um, I I am still sad that there's going to be no spectators, um, even though they would certainly support the the home athlete. Right. Um, I still think it's um, it's sad that, that there's going to be no spectators, but um, believe it or not, I don't know if you've seen, but Tomoe Ito has come out of retirement for the Tokyo Games. So not only do I have uh, Sato to kind of keep an eye on, but um, Ito has always been strong and he could very well be strong in Tokyo. And there could well be some team tactics that are used on you. I mean, you you have a bullseye on your on your back right now. That's for sure. So now we, we did get this straight. You, you are not fluent in Japanese, but yes. you have studied some Japanese. Yes, that's right. So I am not fluent in Japanese. That was, uh, I would say, a misprint that happened back in like 2014 or 2015. Um, but that apparently is a very good story, especially now with Tokyo coming up. So that uh, sort of um, misprint has resurfaced. So I've had to do a lot of correcting about my Japanese skills. Um, but I did study Japanese, so um, I do understand some of it. I can speak a very little amount. I'm going to have to brush up for the Tokyo Games. Um, but no, I'm not fluent in Japanese. Do you know it well enough that if these guys are talking about you in the middle of the race and they're, they're talking about their plan, do you think you might know what they're... I mean, not, don't, give a, don't give away all your secrets. I don't want... <laughs> You know, if they're talking about you, do you think you might be able to listen and go, oh, okay, okay, that's what's happening? All right, good. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I mean, if they're going on, like, long sentences about what the plan is, I don't think I'd be able to understand. But I think if they um, say my name or say something kind of um, suspicious, I would say, yes, I might be able to pick up on it. <laughs> well, that's good. They should, they should be forewarned. And yeah. interesting also that, that you're not as trained right now as you had been. And one, I mean, also, you're not the new kid either, right? 2012, you were the new kid. You are a wizened veteran and, the, and you have a lot of experience right now. But why, why are you not as trained now as you were at the previous games? Yeah, so um, a couple of life changes have happened to me. Um, so I'll start with last year. Um, I actually had an injury that put me out of training for about six months. Um, and it was actually the worst timing for this to happen because this happened in, I want to say about March of 2020. So um, had the games not been postponed, this kind of would have bled into the games because the games were supposed to happen in what, August? September of 2020. Um, so that put, set me back quite a bit. And what and was I the injury? Also, so yeah, so I actually um, have a fractured um, bone in my wrist. So I fractured my lunate and 
Um, we tried resting it, letting it heal. Um, that took about 12 weeks and we did some rescans, never healed. So then I saw a surgeon and he decided that um, that bone is actually condemned. So it's not gonna heal on its own. So we had to come up with a plan. This was around June of 2020. I believe the games were postponed at this time. So it was a safe option, but I could either go a more aggressive route with treatment where I would actually have a fusion um, in my wrist. And that would certainly be more recovery time. Um, but we, what we ended up doing was um, sort of a Band-Aid treatment where he just kind of snipped the nerves to that bone. So it reduced the pain. So I'm able to train, um, but the bone itself is not reinforced in any way. So that, I'm going to lose that bone at some point. So, um, okay. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> the, the plan was that that was temporary and that, that has had to be longer than expected. But this has had to last me longer than expected. So, but it's holding up. Wow. And how long did you have to take off before you could get back to training? Yeah. So um, the first, um, the first doctor had me out for eight weeks, I think, um, like no training, full stop, let it heal. Um, after eight weeks, it was still hurting. So he extended it to 12 weeks. So that's three months now. After 12 weeks, we did a rescan and there was no healing. So then um, he says, you can't, you still can't push on it. Like I'm not, I'm not allowing that. But what we can do is send you to a surgeon. So the surgeon saw me, he was like, yeah, I mean, you can't push on it, but what we can do is um, here are your treatment options and let's go from there. So the recovery for um, my surgery was, I wanna say about six weeks. So when we add the six and the 12 and any sort of like travel time and all that stuff, um, it added up to close to six months of no training. Wow. Six months with no training. And this is, this is six months. I mean, it would have been, it would have been crazy last year if it had been, if you'd continued to have the games, right? If, they, if, if COVID hadn't postponed the games. So you had, but you, you still, you went from March effectively until September. Yep. Without being able to push. Yep. I, yes, that's right. Um, Cause um, I remember around September, he kind of gave me the okay. It's like if it if it doesn't hurt, and like once your stitches are kind of healed, you can try it. So I was very cautious at that point. And I'm not usually cautious about racing, but um, after six months of being out and not knowing whether the surgery worked or not, um, it was it was a little bit nerve wracking. Wow. So were you able to do anything in the interim? Were you were you swimming? Were you no. Yeah, uh, no, I wasn't. So I had pictures of me doing a bunch of like trying to do, I would say a bunch of stuff. But the problem when you're um, a wheelchair athlete is that most of your options involve your upper limbs, if not all of them do. Yeah. Right. So I tried things like using um, like a, a hand bike in the gym just to try and stay fit. Um, but that put pressure. Um, the bone is kind of like right here in the palm aspect mm -hmm. um, that put pressure. So I wasn't able to do that. I tried hand cycling. I even tried, he gave me a cast to kind of use. So I said, oh, okay, maybe I'll like use the cast and maybe I can hand cycle. That didn't work. That exacerbated it. So I was just kind of at a loss um, for trying to stay fit in that time. Wow. Okay. And so then, then you're, you're rebuilding from September until, until now. And, and you had trials in June. So you had to be you had to be fit because it was, it was a challenge, right? Just meeting an A standard was, was a real challenge at trials to get on the team. So. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It, it was not easy and um, it's relative. It's, it's a substantial amount of time between September of 2020 and the trials, but um, when you're trying to get into, you know, Paralympic Games shape, that's, it's not a lot of time, right? So it, the, the pressure was on for sure. Um, leading up into trials and fortunately I was able to do well enough that I'm going to Tokyo and now we've got what two and a half weeks or so three weeks and so hopefully I can get some good training in the next two weeks as much as I can and 
that'll have to be that'll have to be it. Wow, and you had two and a half months is effectively between trials and when you'll compete, or two, yeah, two, two, two plus months between trials and when you'll compete in Tokyo. But you also you're going to PA school too, right? So you had the injury and you had this physician's assistant school that you're going to, which I'd imagine is taking a bit of your time. Yes, it certainly is. So uh, the second reason why um, I might not be as well conditioned as I was is because I actually moved to the Champagne. So I'm no longer in Illinois. I don't have that great training environment that we talked about earlier. Um, and I'm now in Houston and I am going to PA school at Baylor College of Medicine. And it's very time consuming. They tell you that it's a lot ahead of time and they can tell it to you until they're in the face, but until you're in it, you really don't understand. Um, we're in class Monday to Friday, eight to five, and it's just nonstop. When you have six, six to 10 classes, we have 10 classes this term, when you have that many classes, just trying to keep up and like not forget about a class is a challenge. So we try to throw in things like, oh, can I get two sessions in today? Or, oh, like, do I really have the energy to go lift right now? Like I was just in the anatomy lab for three hours. It, it's a different challenge for sure. So now you've had the injury, you're in school. Will, will Tokyo in some ways be almost like a gift to you? It's like, you get a little bit of time to do what you want to do. Will you be able to turn off the noise, or how are you? How, how do you think you'll approach it? Uh, I think it's going to be a gift and a curse at the same time. I'll be able to see all my friends from Champagne and all my teammates on Team USA in Tokyo, and that'll be amazing. I won't be in Houston anymore. However, I think it's going to be just as hot in Tokyo. So it's not like I'm escaping the heat, but um, I also still have to keep up. So, I mean, like I said, it's Monday to Friday, eight to five. So I'm missing a substantial amount of lectures. And I actually have four midterms that week that I need to reschedule. And actually I need to get back to my course director tonight about it. So um, it's just like, Yes, I won't be in class and I won't be in the anatomy lab like all day while I'm in Tokyo, but I will have this thing kind of like hang overhead, right? That, oh, I have three exams to do on the Tuesday I get back, right? Ooh, okay, okay. Well, I mean, this is, you, you develop this sort of uh, mentality, right? Of just sort of removing yourself from the situation do you think you'll do you think you'll be able to do that when you get on the line in Tokyo is that going to be the objective yeah so actually I think that's kind of where it comes back to being gifts right so worrying that I have a physiology exam that I'm missing might take my mind off the fact that I'm at the Paralympic Games and I'm sitting next to Tato and Ito and all the other amazing competitors like I could just worry about that instead there you go. Well, I think that that's going to be, it's going to be interesting for me to watch. I hope it's interesting for you. And you'll be doing one, four, uh, eight, and 15. Is that right? Uh, we just have the one, four, and 15. One, the the four, and 15. meters, like a combined with the 53s, and we can't hang with the 53s, right? So effectively, we have the one, four, and 15. So your 800 is combined with the 53s. Is that what you said? Really? Yeah. So technically, yeah, if you look at the algebra classes, we do have the 800, but it's run with the 53. So we have to run a 132 or something to qualify, which is, that's, that's not happening. So. Right. Exactly. Wow. Okay. Well, well, so, so one, four and 15. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I will look forward to watching you in that best of best of luck. Thank you for taking time out of such a busy schedule to talk with me and, and amazing stories too. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. I hope that you get to go to Tokyo or at least you get to cover some, some of the races there. You do a great I, job. I will be covering it. I'll be in Stanford, Connecticut, covering it great. for NBC. So, so I right. will talk about you, but I'll be watching it on, on television in a, in a sound booth and in Stanford, Connecticut. All right. Well, I look forward to your coverage. All right. Well, thanks a ton, Ray. Really appreciate it. Good luck in Tokyo. 
Thank you to all of you for, for tuning in. If you didn't get a chance to see the whole interview, it will be archived on the One Revolution page on Facebook. Our the greatest gift you can give us is to tell your friends to like us, to follow us. This will be a traditional podcast eventually as well. YouTube, Spotify, Apple, and, and please like us, follow us, tell your friends. We will continue to get great stories. And this will also help me for my commentary in NBC. So I appreciate it. Have a good one. Good luck, Ray. Thanks for talking.